attending these sessions um, and making uh, making the Zoom version of the Arts and Humanities Colloquium uh, such, such a success uh, in this incredibly difficult semester. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for your leadership of the uh, Colloquium Planning Committee. It's much appreciated. Uh, so good morning and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this the third event in VIU's Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series for fall 2020. My name is uh, Dr. Tim Lewis, I'm professor of chair in the Department of History. And again, it's been my pleasure to be serving as the host for these events this year. Let me begin by acknowledging that Vancouver Island University and Nanaimo at large are located on the traditional territory of the Sunaymo First Nation. Please always be appreciative of that, of that fact and look for opportunities whenever you have, uh, whenever you can to work towards reconciliation with First Peoples. A reminder too about proper Zoom etiquette, although it looks like everyone is on board here, that to make sure you're muted uh, unless you're speaking. Uh, again, a little slash should be through the microphone icon on the left. Because uh, again, if uh, you're unmuted, then people can hear everything that's going on around you. So thanks for that. Those of us on the Arts and Humanities Colloquium Planning Committee would also like to express our continuing gratitude to the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities and to the Dean herself, Dr. Marnie Stanley, for the ongoing financial and moral support that she provides to allow the series to continue even in this alternative Zoom format. And speaking of Marnie and Zoom, and given that we are approaching a holiday season that will perhaps be a little less joyful for many, I've decided to set my traditional trade of thank you to Marnie to the tune of Elvis Presley's classic Blue Christmas. So here it goes. <clears throat> There'd be no Zoom colloquiums without you. Without the money that you give us, we'd be so blue. Research still could be done, but we could talk to no one. If money didn't fund these Zoom colloquiums, oh, there'd be no Zoom colloquiums without you if that were true hey that simply would not do all our thoughts smart and rare well we just could not share if money did not fund these zoom colloquiums we thank money we thank money very much <laughs> So, yes, there we go. Okay, well, um, the bad Elvis impersonator has now left the building, and so let's restore a bit of dignity to our proceedings. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sonnet LeBay, professor in and chair of VIU's creative writing department, as she will be providing the introduction of today's featured speaker, uh, VIU English professor, Dr. Sarah Crover. So, Sonnet. Thank you, Tim. Morning, everyone. So do you know how you have that, that friend, maybe, yeah, that friend, that friend that when you go walking on the trails, they know the names of all the plants around and they spot, you're just walking along, but they spot rare mushrooms out of the corner of their eye. And then you're seeing a species that, you know, is totally rare and, but you didn't see it, but they did. Um, the kind of person who, if you were at Butter Tubbs Marsh with them, would be able to tell a Mergenser from a Mallard when all you see is ducks. Sarah Crover is that kind of person. I'm trying to look at Sarah in my Zoom while, while I do this. I try to make eye contact. <laughs> um, she grew up on the island and her upbringing allowed her to develop a keen eye for her natural environment and a deep delight in knowing her green surroundings intimately. To go on a forest walk with Sarah is often to learn something new about the place that you're in and to have new language for what you see. Sarah is relatively new to VIU, but I actually first met her in the PhD program at UBC. We were in different cohorts, so we didn't get to know each other well during grad student life, but every now and then we'd run into each other in the grad lounge in the Buchanan building, and I got a taste of her dry wit and her vibrant descriptiveness when recounting her adventures of the day or the brilliance of our professors. 
I always mistook Sarah for a Victorianist because she seemed bright and observant about people in a Jane Austen-esque kind of way. But Sarah is an early modernist and brings both energies, a sassy literary wit and an attention to ecologies to her narratives of early modern life. I'm not even in her class, but just from casual conversations about what she's writing about or thinking about, my own imagining of the Thames River has expanded from the dirty river beside the Globe Theater to understanding it as the center of political intrigues, class dramas, and 16th century fashionista's sense of where to be seen. The more I get to know Sarah, the more I can see how her research interests reflect both her literary social sensibility and her sense of how all our stories are supported by the earth and water around us. Dr. Sarah Crover joined the English department at Vancouver Island University after holding a Solmson Fellowship at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for 2018-19. She works on the cultural history of the Thames, London theater, and eco-criticism. She has published in various collections and journals, including Studies in the Age of Chaucer and Early Modern Culture. Her current book project with Amsterdam University Press is entitled Stage and Street, Theatrical Water Shows and the Cultural History of the Early Modern Thames, which draws on extensive research in London's civic records, chronicle histories, drama and poetry to retell the story of the network of ecological relationships between the Thames and its human neighbors. Her forthcoming work will examine three overlooked morally dubious figures, mermaids, which are prostitutes, petermen, which were illegal fishermen, and watermen, ferrymen of the river, that haunted the outskirts of early modern London, all those river figures. She's also co-editing an essay collection with Natalia Komenko at York on the stagings of a Midsummer Night's Dream around the world, analyzing the stakes of adapting a play for specific cultural, social, and political contexts. It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sarah Krover. Thank you so much, Sonnet. Uh, I'm gonna take just a minute to pull up my slides. So forgive me for the annoying pause as I make sure that they are up and that you guys can see them. There we are. So thank you to Sonnet for such a lovely introduction and to Catherine and Tim for setting this up and the Arts and Humanities Colloquium for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, as well as to Ravi and Robin for navigating technology and giving me advice about what to do and putting together promotional slides. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Sinanamo peoples at home in the midst of a pandemic. While I'm very sorry to not be seeing you all in person, I'm very grateful to be here safely on the island with such wonderful colleagues who have Zoomed in at the end of a grueling semester when we have surely become entirely fed up with Zoom and anything forcing us to stare at more screens. I also want to acknowledge that at different stages of this research, at different stages, this research project has been generously supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the Theatre Society of the UK, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, without whom my numerous visits to the Thames and also the British Library would never have been possible. So my discussion on frost fairs is part of a larger project on the early modern Thames. This project analyzes not only dramatic activity on the Thames in early modern London, but also the ways that the river shaped the cultural history of the city itself. I argue for a more very varied and dynamic eco-critical engagement with this protean river. I show that the Thames shaped form formulations of English national identity as much as desires of cultural ascendancy inscribed the Thames. While water pageants and local legends inscribed the river's surfaces, transforming them into controlled or practiced places that contributed to the generation of civic and national mythologies, the riverine movements of the Thames, both familiar and strange, continually destabilized these fantasies of mastery. Ultimately, I argue that the river slipped past all the regulations and stories generated to contain it 
and reshape the cultural landscape of London in the process. What I'm presenting to you today is a portion of my fourth chapter. When I was working on the finishing touches of this presentation, hesitating over what I wanted to be my entry point, Terry sent me an article recently published in The Guardian that did it for me. Deadly frost and war with the French, Britain's recession of the 1700s. This article goes on to describe one of the greatest economic downturns Britain had ever seen. In 1709, in the midst of an economically ruinous war with the French, a prolonged cold snap across Europe destroyed crops, halted trade, killed animals and humans alike, and froze the London Thames. The article goes on to draw parallels between then and now, commenting, quote, in the centuries that followed, economic downturns have largely reached to the consequences of wars, inflammatory, or sorry, inflationary booms, or pol policy blunders probably all of three at the same time. The economic distress caused by the coronavirus pandemic is the first in a very long time to have been brought about by the natural world, end quote. I'm not entirely sure that last bit is true, uh, but there's no getting around the fact that we are now in the midst of another so-called natural disaster. In fact, two, if you count, count climate change that is pushing us to our limits globally, testing both our resilience and ingenuity. So it seems eerily timely that I should be talking to you today about another such dramatic event, or rather a series of events across approximately 500 years that transformed the city in which they occurred. The first time the term frost bear was officially employed to mark the temporary carnival space that sprang up during the enduring freeze of the London Thames was during the hard frost of 1683-84. Although events matching such a description had been taking place during freezes on the river for at least a hundred years previous that might easily have matched that description. The world of the London frost fair is a contradictory one. London on ice seems to operate simultaneously as a competitive outgrowth of the city and an alluring disreputable double. Contemporary descriptions of the river freezes and frost fairs seem to find the transformation of the Thames into a London street by turns reassuring and unsettling, depending on whether the descriptions figured the frost as a meteorological disaster or a new opportunity for human ingenuity to triumph over nature. As the following pages will detail, Many accounts of the river freezes seem to look for ways to impose a sense of order on a disordering event, often relying upon a fabricated sense of tradition to mend the fissures in a, in a mythology of Thames supported English ascendancy by attempting to recast what amounted to an agricultural and mercantile setback into a celebration. Yet the desire to reestablish order through a sense of mastery and tradition runs uneasily counter to an equally, equally strong sense of the frozen Thames as an ephemeral carnival world. These two versions of the frozen Thames, I argue, operate in constant tension, fueled by both the desire to explain and commemorate the frozen river into order and predictability, and the sense spurred by human readings of the river as a liminal space, that the Thames has its own less anthropocentric systems and agendas. There is no consensus as to how many times the London Thames froze solid. Contemporary chronicles do not always specify how much or which part of the river froze when they note a river freeze. At other times, they simply refer to a hard frost without going into further detail. Current research on, pre -modern, on the pre-modern Thames suggests that it froze over somewhere between 23 and 35 times. What can be ascertained is that the reduced temperatures of the Little Ice Age, in combination with the thick starlings of Old London Bridge, which was completed in 1209 and slowed the river significantly, made London River freezes more frequent. Since the dismantlement of the Old Bridge, and the end of the Little Ice Age, the Thames outside London has not once frozen solid. Further up the river, it has. During these relatively unusual events, the normal business of the river ground to a halt. And sometimes, particularly from the late 16th century onward, fairs were set up on the ice, Londoners and visitors alike, venturing onto this precarious landscape to explore its temporary terrain. 
The result was an expansion of London proper, as well as the creation of a carnivalesque liminal space more fitted for games and small scale pageantry than workaday life. The city temporary, temporarily spilt over into the river, and the river hosted city activities normally constructed on land, conducted, I should say. These events, however, were rare, and in the course of my research, I uncovered a curious penchant among writers and historians for elaboration and downright fabrication. There are many examples of unsubstantiated tales that invent incidences on the river conscripting figures from Empress Matilda to Elizabeth I. So if you take a here, look here at the slide, we have Empress Matilda supposedly escaping across the frozen Thames at Oxford during the anarchy in 1142. No evidence that that happened, although there was one contemporary chronicler, famous for lying, by the way, who claimed she did. In 1536, what seems to be a misunderstanding of a uh, contemporary account gets interpreted as Henry VIII and Jane Seymour have riding across the ice to Greenwich uh, and having a sort of royal exit pageant there. In fact, they rode over the bridge, much less dramatic. And in 1564, uh, the claim is that Elizabeth I went to shoot at marks on the ice. Uh, while people did do this, there's no evidence that Elizabeth herself was there. One of the most famous of these apocryphal tales, which is still frequently reported as true, involves Shakespeare. According to legend, Shakespeare and his men secreted the timbers of the dismantled theater. That's both the name of it and its function. Super, um, super creative. Uh, they secreted across the frozen river and to Southwark, where they would eventually be used to build the Globe Theatre. They do make off with the timbers. Um, there's no evidence they carried them across the ice. This persistent re reappearance of made up fairs and royal ridings across the ice embedded within accounts of the frozen Thames bears witness to a desire for continuity through the establishment of long standing traditions imagined or real. Particularly in association with the river, there is, from quite an early date, a visible longing for the tracing of activities of great antiquity. One might even say that frost fairs come into being as a tradition, partly because they were wished into tradition. Even before it was formally named a frost fair, Londoners began documenting the events on the frozen river and attempting to stretch their history back to the time immemorial. But Stephen's 12th century laudation of the city of London, for instance, proudly details revelry on the iced over Moors fields as part of the noble city's entertainments. A 1608 pamphlet describing the London freeze includes a list of historical freezes and events on the river stretching back to the 11th century. Very few of which can be substantiated by historians. By the time of the final flares, fairs in the 19th century, the first London frost fairs are attributed to the 7th century. And interestingly, I just came across a peer reviewed article in, for geology that lists that seventh, that seventh century fair as a real thing um, based on a 19th century uh, text. These fabricated chronologies, more than anything else, are a testament to the fact that Londoners had a highly developed sense of unique identity and a strong desire to produce evidence of that identity from a very early period. It was during a time of anxious identity formation in England, the reign of Elizabeth I, that the first detailed contemporary descriptions of a frost of a Thames freeze were reported by one of London's most meticulous chroniclers, John Stowe. In December of 1564, a cold snap began that resulted in the freezing of the London Thames. On New Year's Eve, People went out over the Thames on the ice and along the Thames from the London Bridge to Westminster. And again, a great number of people played at the football as boldly and, thanks God, as safely as on dry land. Diverse gentlemen and others set up pricks on the Thames and shot at the same. And great numbers of people standing at either prick beholding the same. And the people, both men and women, went on the Thames in great numbers, greater numbers than in any street in London. The costard mongers stood in diverse places and played at dice for apples on the ice. 
but on Friday, being the fifth day of January at night, was no ice on the Thames to be seen. It was so suddenly consumed, which sudden thaw caused such great floods and high waters that it bare down many bridges and houses and drowned many people. Although it was still another century before an event on the Thames is called a frost bear, this 1564-65 event is the earliest freeze that is long enough and sufficiently organized enough to have established vendors such as costume mongers, apple sellers basically, and recognized layout and a recognized layout that Stowe can identify as being street-like. It is generally regarded as a precedent for the increasingly elaborate events during the subsequent freezes that eventually culminate in the official titular frost bear in 1683-84. Stowe explicitly draws the parallel that the Thames has become as frequented with people as any street in London, reaffirming this place the Thames held in the eyes of a London citizen. This notion that the city streets have somehow spilled over onto the river suggests that boundaries between the city and the land, city on the land and the river have vanished. Thus, in a strange way, Stowe's description, which seems to envision the city expanding and overriding the river, also implies that the river has taken over the city. The Thames has replaced its streets, stolen its inhabitants, and taken over its trade. Unexpectedly, what makes up London in this moment is familiar material realities, food and drink and citizens, not mappable street coordinates. By the 1608 freeze, pamphlets are being published to mark the freeze as a special event and to commemorate it. This particular hard frost began around the 8th of December, but the river did not freeze in earnest until the 3rd of January. The Great Frost, Cold Doings in London, a dialogue, relates, both men and women and children walked over and up and down in such companies that I verily believe the one half if not three parts of the people in the city have been seen going on the Thames. The river showed not now, neither shows it not yet like a river, but like a field where archers shoot at pricks while others play at football. You can hear the echoes of Stowe. It is a place of mastery where some wrestle and some run and he that does best is aptest to take a fall. It is an alley to walk upon without dread, albeit under, the, under it the most assured danger. The gentlewoman that trembles to pass over a bridge in the field doth here walk boldly. Thirst you for beer, ale, or victuals? There you may buy it, because you may tell another day how you dined upon the Thames. Are you cold with going over? You shall hear, you shall, ere you come to the midst of the river, spy some ready with pans of coals to warm your fingers. If you want fruit after you have dined, there stands costermongers to serve you at your call. And thus do people leave their houses and the streets, turning the goodliest river in the whole kingdom into the broadest street to walk in. This account is framed as a dialogue between a citizen and a countryman from Yorkshire. The Yorkshireman inquires after the state of the Thames and the citizen fills him in and takes him and the reader on a tour of the revels to be had on the ice. Oops, my document just did something strange. Early on, they stop at a pub to refresh themselves that may or may not actually be one of the refreshment tents the citizen mentions. This framing device's overall effect suggests a simple unvarnished account by two honest salt of the earth, every man figures. The Great Frost describes a carnivalesque liminal space in which normal rules are suspended and give way to misrule that is as dangerous as it is fascinating. I'll just note that I don't know if you can tell, but the man sitting in the chair is getting a shave on the ice. The account is infused with merriment, grit, and rough and tumble humor. The citizens play and fall down, drink when they are tired, and warm their fingers by coal pans. Ashes are spread to make the ground less slippery, and ice is neither smooth nor even hard in all places. The citizen talks about running streams on the edge of the more solid ice and great flakes and caked crusts piling around the piers and the arches of London Bridge. People drown during this fair. In response to the countryman's query about deaths on the river, the citizen describes with relish how 
quote, some have fallen in up to the knees, others to the middle, others to the armpits, yea, and some have been ducked over head and ears, yet have crawled out like drowned rats, while others have sunk to the bottom that never rose again to the top. They have a cold bed to lie in. He then continues with the tales of all those who have dashed their brains out or broken their necks from slipping on the ice, usually while drunk. Still, despite the macabre humor and the pauses from time to time to moralize on the profligate lifestyles of urban sinners, the mood in the pamphlet is one of merriment. Even when the citizen pauses to note the privation caused by the merchant ships trapped in the ice locked river and the cold doings of the now underemployed watermen, he quickly moves on to further narrations of enter entertainments on the river. How the watermen have conveyed converted their ferry boats into sledges, for instance, to convey customers across, and how the cold, hungry urbanites play at nine pins and pigeonholes to divert themselves. Although the event of the frost is described as terrible on the title page, and although some time is devoted to relating the privation caused by the cold snap, there is a barely concealed gleeful relish about the whole pamphlet. Even the cover illustration depicts only revelry, not disaster. As the pamphleteer states, it is a place of mastery, where one masters physical challenges and games and sports, but also where one masters the environment, turning a potentially catastrophic happenstance into an occasion for play and profit. The arrangement of the text into a dialogue between a London citizen and a countryman from Yorkshire is a clever touch. In the text, the frozen river acts as a catalyst that brings together two individuals who would be unlikely to otherwise meet. They chat amicably on and about the London Thames and the differences between the city life and country life. Their dialogue makes the river serve as the locus around which identity is defined and shared. The text manages to imply that there are clear differences between Londoners and countrymen while at the same time suggesting that the river is a unifying source of shared identity. When, after hearing all the news available of the current frost, the countryman begins to relate what he remembers of diversions on the frozen Thames during Elizabeth I's reign, it becomes apparent that this supposed Yorkshireman was a Londoner in his youth. Suddenly, the narrative seems to imply that there are only Londoners in the world, those that live there, those that used to live there, and those that will live there in the future. Suddenly the narrative seems to imply that there are only Londoners in the world, those that live there, those that used to live there, and those that will live there in the future. The London Thames becomes every Englishman's natural habitat. The Frost Fair of 1683 lasts longer, has more divertisements, and generates more pamphlets and souvenirs than even the events of 1608 but it contains the same air of holiday escape from the quotidian, uh, quotidian, sorry, and its pamphlets contain the same descriptions of animal baitings, refreshment booths, and river sports. Over time, frost fairs become increasingly associated with a kind of carnivalesque mistral. The seeds of this topsy-turvy world are already present in the descriptions of frolicking and drinking in 1608, but they become more pronounced in the 1683-84 event. Robert Bedard notes that this frost fair, quote, had a touch of the performing circus about it, with its menageries, peep shows, and novelties. The drinking, the brothels, and the blood sports during this frost fair offers a perfect exemplum of Rabelaisian excess. Indeed, contemporary accounts seem to be conscious of this festive inversion. For example, in his first-hand account of the fair, Robert Morris, a London nonconformist, Dis disapprovingly comments in his journal that during the fair, quote, the concourse and all manner of debauchery upon the Thames continued upon the Lord's Day, Sunday. John Taylor, the self-styled water poet, rhymes of a later frost fair that some trod the Thames as boldly as the ground, knowing their fortunes was not to be drowned. And sure, the honest river is so true, it will not rob the gallows of his due. And this, of course, in case you don't know, is a, a reference to a saying that some people were born to be hanged. 
um, and, and you could sort of look at their face and say like, oh, that's a countenance of a guy that was born to be hanged. Uh, so the idea is because they're born to be hanged, they can't drown. Another ballad warns women in particular to stay off the ice for quote, you are apt to fall where there's no ice, oft on your back, but seldom on your face. How can you stand then on such a slippery place? Many of the ballads speak glancingly of fears about what the freezing of the estuary means for the island nation of England and her seafaring trade-based economy, but quickly reassure the reader that environmental catastrophes are subordinate to God's plan. Hardly reassuring, I would think. Alvin Snyder notes that, quote, thinking about the weather played a crucial role in the formation of national identities, unquote. The cool temperatures of the late 17th century and the resultant frost fair of 83-84 sparked fears about vanishing temperate climates in England, which were believed to be responsible for the ascendancy of the English people and the British Empire. If, quote, weather and climate played a key role in forming English body worlds and a sense of English identity, unquote, then the 16th and 17th century entertainments on the icy river would have held national significance, not only because they marked a relatively unusual historical event, but also because they might presumably have the power to turn civic and natural character upside down. The need for personal commemorations of one's visit to a frost fair is first documented during the 1608 freeze. The great frost in several places pauses to offer suggestions of what a visitor to the ice can do to make their visit special. For example, the citizen advises the countryman that if he eats at a tavern on the river, quote, you may well tell another day how you dined upon the Thames. Later in the text, the citizen relates how there are two barber shops on the ice and endless lines of people so that the barbers, quote, did more barbarous work than if it were a Saturday, which is the traditional day to get your barbering done. The visitors do not even need a shave, yet, quote, yet they would here be shaved because another day they might report that they lost their hair between the Bankside and London. Later fairs would make, would make shrewd use of this usage for unique moments on the ice. The 1608 pamphlet was printed on London Bridge, which seems to have been an early attempt to associate the printer of the text with the frozen watery environs it described. Later frost fairs had commemorative texts actually printed on the ice. By the time of the 1683-84 fair, this kind of printing was in abundance. These souvenir pamphlets had a fairly standard format. They normally included a discussion of the current frost fair and the rebels to be had on the ice, a catalog of terrible drownings, lost wages and debauchery. Some prints of the fair and poems addressed to or given by the Thames, and frequently a list of great historical friezes of London, sometimes brought into the world. Indeed, there seems to be something irresistible about making lists of river friezes. Both the 1608 and 1814 commemorative pamphlets employ them, and modern coffee table books on the frozen Thames include them, as do the British Library and the British Museum. The more modern the compiler, the more deeply aware he or she must be that no such comprehensive list can be achieved, and yet the trend continues. The various texts make lists of the dates of the freezes and the lengths, lists of the temperatures known or guessed, lists of the lengths of the frost fairs, and so on. Each list implies a desire for mastery, as well as commemoration, as if a complete chronology of river freezes or fairs or temperatures could somehow return control of the unpredictable river to human hands. Perhaps too, these lists are about making the exceptional normal, even predictable. The longer the list, the more average these icy exceptions to the liquid river become, and the more open to human management. The fact that a human bridge was partially responsible for making all these river freezes possible does not seem to assuage the author's underlying unease about human abilities to master riparian space. In addition to commemorative pamphlets, prints, poems, and songs, by this time, one could also get personalized souvenir prints, such as poems composed to match the buyer's request or the equivalent of early modern postcards bearing an engraving from the fair, along with a space to add the name of the recipient, the date he or she visited the ice, and the particular on-ice print shop 
that produced the text. A wealthy family might purchase one to commemorate their daring stroll upon the frozen river. Prince survived, for instance, for the Earl of Clarendon and his family. A more humble visitor might have simply a print with their name added, such as this one uh, to the right for Mrs. Margareta Maria Bull. Even kings were not immune to the novelty of these souvenirs. A surviving print commemorates Charles II's visit to the Frost Fair in 1684, that's on the left. Note how the paper emphasizes that it has been printed on the ice. Yet again, the main reason one would purchase such a thing is because its location of production was unique and afforded a kind of bragging rights. As a commemorative souvenir, it would also freeze that moment, pardon the pun, in time. It would be proof that one dared to pace the temporary roads of the icy river. By the end of the 17th century, the impulse to commemorate the frosts and amass souvenirs from them has shifted into a desire to catalog, compile, and produce private volumes documenting the history and events of the frosts. We see a growing desire to make the events of the freezes special or significant, both socially and politically. For example, we owe the survival of frost fair ephemera, such as the prints above, to collectors who saved them Along, long enough for 19th century antiquarians to catalog and guile them in archives. The fact that we have copies of a print commemorating, commemorating King Charles' visit to the iced over Thames suggests that in fact, multiple copies were made and indeed versions exist in the Bodleian and the British Library. This print, in other words, was probably the equivalent of modern royal memorabilia, plates, tea towels, etc., celebrating the marriage of say, Harry and Meghan, for instance. It was proof that not only had something unusual happened on the river, but that the head of state had formally acknowledged it had occurred by visiting the fair and the river himself or herself and even selected their own souvenir. Frost fairs were being read as historical events, something to be noted, commemorated and discussed. The same collection I accessed for the pamphlets includes various newspaper clippings detailing freezings of the London Thames. They echo Stowe's early account and that of the various pamphlets and poems produced thereon. 1684 London newspaper notes, this winter was remarkable for a violent frost which began about the beginning of December and without intercession continued intensely sharp until the 5th of February, which congealed the River Thames to that degree that another city, as it were, was erected thereon, where by the great number of streets and shops with their rich furniture, it presented a great fair with a variety of carriages and diversions of all sorts. And near Whitehall, a whole ox was roasted upon the ice. This is quite true. The narrative frames the frozen Thames as another city, a kind of riverine double of London, competing with all the structure and divertisements of the land city, streets, shops, vehicles, and diversions, and infused with a kind of temporary holiday air. After all, the city on the Thames would not be any kind of London. It would be a precarious bust of London that might vanish with deadly effect, effect at any given moment with a thaw and the change of the tide. And this picture here shows how most river freezes worked out. They weren't generally smooth enough to create fairs upon because of the river being tidal at that spot, as soon as the tide changed, there were massive drops in the level of the river and big ice flows. Even con every contemporary account emphasizes how quickly a thaw could set in. According to Peter Jackson, tide change was the most dangerous time to be upon the ice. A high tide would occur every 12 hours and would often fracture the ice, making visits to the frozen London Thames precarious at best. Consistently, these accounts and descriptions of the frozen river across a thousand years, whether real or fictive, reveal a drive to apply meaning and community, continuity to a space that held only transitory existence. Each text acknowledges that the frozen space is not the same as the liquid space of the Thames, but no text will allow it to be a space without meaning. Each chronicler overwrites this frozen river space with significance even when they do not agree on what type of significance it ought to have. It is as if the pacing of the river bounds must be reenacted as soon as it freezes over. 
its pathless ways must be reconstructed into meaningful locations, London streets. The heightened significance attached to the Thames operates as a staging ground for both the precarity and the vitality of London itself. The streets etched out on the, tra on the ice trace out a microcosm of the city, condensing all its industry, crime, and social engagements into one small space. The result is an illicit is illicit management, topsy-turvy relations, shameful minglings, and a kind of carpe diem feeling, as each and every reveler knows that the ice on which they stand may betray them, so, them to their deaths at any moment. However, the desire to reestablish order through a sense of mastery and traditions runs counter to the acceptance of the frozen Thames as an ephemeral carnival world. If the frozen Thames is always already a source of merriment and mischief, it is also the place where events that flag critical moments in English history occur from Matilda to Elizabeth. It is a place that causes historian, author, and tourists to reassure themselves with lists and commemorative souvenirs that prove this freeze means something and will be remembered. Their writings cry out for evidence of human mastery, be it streets, historical turning points, or meteorological patterns over the unpredictable river. In the background of this paper, you will likely have heard the voices of spatial theorists Michel de Certeau, Henri Lefebvre, as well as readings of the carnivalesque that properly belong to Mikhail Bakhtin. I have indeed drawn upon de Certeau's notion of space as practice place and Bakhtin's notion of carnival time, but these models of subversion and containment, or containment and subversion, in the case of de Certeau, fall short when it comes to thinking about a non-human entity like a body of water which has, in these accounts, a kind of subjectivity that radically challenges human autonomy in all of its socio-cultural manifestations. To understand the ecological aspect of the Thames accounts, I have turned to eco-criticism. I am not going to delve too far into these ideas now, except to suggest that it is the elemental Thames that continues to captivate readers, writers, I should say, over time. Virginia Woolf's description in her 1928 novel, Orlando, is perhaps one of the most famous literary descriptions of a London Frost Fair. <clears throat> but while the country people suffered the extremity of want and the trade of the country was at a standstill, London enjoyed a carnival of the utmost brilliancy. The court was at Greenwich and the new king seized the opportunity that his coronation gave him to curry favor with the citizens. He directed that the river, which was frozen to a depth of 20 feet and more for six or seven miles on either side, should be swept, decorated, and given all the semblance of a park or pleasure ground with arbors, mazes, alleys, drinking booths, etc., at his expense. Here and there burnt vast bonfires of cedar and oak wood lavishly salted so that the flames were of green, orange, and purple fire. But however fiercely they burnt, the heat was not enough to melt the ice, which, though of singular transparency, was yet of the hardness of steel. Wolfe's gorgeous account of the frost fair on the Thames during the reign of James I is drawn from the accounts I've shown you today, although it's considerably, pretty, considerably prettied up. While she makes much of the sociality of the frost fair she describes, note the final fascination with the quality of the ice. It always comes back to the environmental phenomenon of a dynamic and vital body congealed into stillness. Nor is Wolf's description the last modern reimagining of the frozen Thames. Helen Humphrey's recent collection of short stories called The Frozen Thames offers an evocative tour through English history as glimpsed through key moments the river froze over. And as fans of Doctor Who may already know, the episode Thin Ice in season 10 has the good doctor pay a visit to London's last frost fair in 1814. I'm going to show you a clip of this. I think we've got time, yes. Um, and I want you to notice how it brings this picture here to life. Rules. 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 Rules.
girls all the time that I mean, I'm not even calling them out, but I could just pick it. So here again, we have an episode that is preoccupied with the quality of the ice as it breathes new life into the historical event it draws upon. Doctor Who has a prehistoric monster devouring unwary visitors who stray too far on the pre precarious surface. But the spectacle and the emphasis on the danger and beauty of the frozen Thames is firmly rooted in the historical events. A frost fair, it seems, is as compelling now as ever it was then. Our enduring fascination with the frozen river is, I propose, rooted in the way that the Thames in all its forms encouraged the conflicting hopes and anxieties of human identity projected onto its waves to erupt from its palimpsest body. Thank you. <laughs> 